and we are live with the latest episode of the Bass Hub Podcast. Myself, Harvey Horn, and Chris Kingry from Florida. So, yeah, lots of lots of different stuff to talk about this afternoon, tonight. In your case, it may be, well, it's, it's 8 o'clock, so it ain't even dark there yet. No, actually, it's still light, surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah, I got to turn the volume back up. So I'm going to turn it down too much. Yeah, okay. Now What's going on, Kenny? Toby? Toby Beach. Get Get Ugly Fishing. fishing. All the people are in here. Yeah, they're jumping on because we actually are out there a little bit more tonight. We're back on the Bass Hub Podcast Facebook page. We're on the 44 Tackle Facebook page. We're on my Facebook page. And I think stephanie's facebook page as well we got some reach tonight all 12 people it's glorious it's gonna get bigger oh yeah yeah so this week from the bass master elite series snagged fish fishing in locks lots of things happened uh great individual won the tournament that uh, I've got a lot of respect for. But it's just, it's becoming the crybaby tour, unfortunately, is what it seems like to me. That, that's bass fishing, not not like any particular tour, just bass fishing in general right now. True. Right. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody is upset when they're not doing well, and you know they have to have a reason to tell people why they're not doing well. I mean... You and I have had plenty of ups and downs over the years, and you've got that dreaded phone call on the way home where everybody's like, well, what happened? You know, I think some of those guys are finally seeing what it's like to have that phone call almost every event right now. You know, like we all had the last few years fishing against some of these guys. Uh, No doubt. No doubt. It's something that we, we, we all go through, save a few people. And I learned long ago, it's nobody else's fault but mine. You know, or, you know, I know the fish are there. You know the fish are there. Some days they just absolutely won't bite. Mm-hmm. And there's nobody at fault for that. You know, it's just nature. We are the only sport out there that competes against a wild animal. That is our competition. When me and you are on the water fishing an open, we're not fishing against each other. We're fishing to try to catch fish that are a wild animal. Mm -hmm. And whether you can see them or can't see them, that doesn't matter. Some days they just don't bite. They just don't. Nothing we can do. Uh, I wish it was easier, but it's not. The guys that uh, have been able to excel the last three years are just better at getting fish to bite. That's all it is. What's up, Frankie? Saw Frankie this weekend at the Elite Series event. Nice. Uh, Frankie was my co-angler at Harris last time we were there. That was an interesting trip, I bet. Uh, Matt Dillon just got home from the lake last night. Storms killed the bite morning and all, and they only caught two bass on a crankbait and a jig. Only fish all day today. That happens. Unfortunately, storms and bass fishing can be a good thing or can be a very bad thing. In my experience, to me, it's always been a bad thing. Get ugly fishing. If you only knew here, let's, let's get the real show out here. I'm gonna make Jaharvey jealous right now. We 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 compare tan lines on the regular. So yeah, see, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit lighter, but it's it's still there, it's still there. You know, go to the left side. It's a little bit darker over here, but uh, yeah, I've been off the water four or five days, but I'm taking care now to wear a hood quite a bit more after seeing the surgery that Matt Heron had bust the hat I'll be wearing this a lot more this summer should have been wearing it for the last few years 
I would say last 20, probably. Yeah. Something like that. Ordinary angler. How's it going, my friend? I've been carrying around some of this the, the last few days because I haven't been able to eat anything without almost crying. Yeah, see, I got, there's, the, I'm at the wife's workstation, so there's, there's always some handy. I probably get like four or five sticks right here close by. So the situation that uh, the train went through with the locks, let, let's let's dig into that real quick. Mm. Um, if you're not familiar with what went down, uh, Trey McKinney was fishing in the locks, around the locks, whatever he was doing. And phone calls were made to the lock master. Now, at this particular lock, Chris can back me up. I'm... 1000 percent sure there is no no fishing signs right so been through it a lot even low you know it's funny um when i was when you first called me and said man everybody's going crazy about the lock thing and i'm like and somebody else had showed me the video um that he they're like you know he was fishing inside the lock and i went well that's not right and my first reaction was you you know i've always known that you know i don't fish in a lock and then i thought about it for a second and i went you know what i don't ever remember seeing a no fishing sign at that lock i, I remember three important signs that were there and those are the only ones i remember seeing and one of them was no smoking no refueling and um no or, and don't molest the alligators that one i remember pretty vividly because it's nowhere else that you ever see that sign other than florida yeah. for some reason uh but but uh that's the only thing i remember i've always fished myself i've always fished around the outside of the lock all the way up to the gate you know when the gates are closed it's like one of my favorite spots is you know because there's a little bit of water flow in there all the time and uh you can usually catch a pretty quick limit there if there's nobody else around and uh so there's eel grass there's all sorts of stuff in front of the door um but uh yeah after thinking about it i was like you know i i don't think there's anything wrong with it and i said uh, i would think that he would have called the tournament director and uh after the first day of that happening i um i ended up talking to trey and tyler and a couple of the other guys and they said yeah we called lisa who's the tournament director for bass and Lisa approved it ahead of time in practice that that it was good for them to fish there because there's no posted sign um and on top of it the thing that people don't understand also is the lock master that was there for the first three days uh also specifically said to Trey that if he was fishing in there they were happy to have him there as long as he didn't get in the way of boat traffic and there was actually multiple times on live where you could watch in the clips that he moved out of the way of boats coming. So the, the lock master would actually tell him that there was a boat on its way. And there's a pretty long route on both sides that the lock master can see. So there's a good probably three minute window of an idle that the lock master knows a boat's coming. And so what Trey had told me was, you know, he uh, he was told that if there was a boat coming, that they would let him know to get out of the way. And that that's exactly what happened. And probably two or three times he had to get out of the way for boat traffic on the one day um, because it was a weekend. And there's tons of pontoon boats that go in and out of that place. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, respectfully, he got in and out of the lock as he was supposed to, uh, as he was told. But, you know, that we live in a world now that, you know, I think that people have to remember that when you're fishing for a hundred thousand dollars, that you have to find every advantage you can get when you're fishing in a field of a hundred plus boats, you know, in this case it was a hundred, but in an open, you know, and maybe that's just my mindset from fishing 225 boats that we're always looking for something. And just like Keith Poche jumping over that dam, that was him looking, not whether it was right or wrong, you know, he didn't ask for, for you know, he's more of a, ask for forgiveness instead of an ask for permission kind of guy. But um, in that instance, it was looking for an edge done the same but that he thought was in that gray area of the rules. Um, in this case, it was actually asked for permission first. 
and abided by what the tournament director said. You can't knock somebody for doing that because the whole rest of the field could have done that. And I saw a lot of comments that said, well, you know, in one person's take, it was uh, they should if that was something that was verified, it should have been announced to the rest of the field. But it wasn't a rule modification that that was made. So it was something that was checked on to see if it was fishable water. Now, if somebody else didn't do their research to think that that could possibly be fishable water, I think that's just on them. I don't think that's anything that should have been announced to the rest of the field because then you'd had 20 boats sitting there. You know, that's that edge that somebody could have been looking for. Um, you know, there's several places on the Harris chain that, that could probably uh, fit into that same mold where people think that you probably can't fish it, but you can you know, there's areas of the marsh that look like it might be on the edge of, you know, unfishable water that's actually fishable. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you're in competition, it, why would Trey go broadcast something that's, you know, him finding his little element of something that, uh, that made it, you know, an advantage. But here's the other thing, like to the guys that are going after him for this stuff, you know, it's not like he caught and won the tournament out of that spot. It's not right. like it changed the, the the way he fished enough that he was going to, uh, you know, be 10 or 20 spots down the way and maybe not make that final 10 cut. You know, we're talking he may have called out over the course of two days an extra couple pounds total. We're not talking tens of pounds that really changed yeah. his life by being there. It was a waste time. Like I've got what I need to make it to tomorrow kind of deal. Let's get a couple extra ounces here um, and, and just fish and be productive. So I wouldn't say now Tyler did say Tyler said he, he fished outside the lock up against the, like uh, the fences, the, the cattle gate or whatever you want to call it, cow pen. Um, and he called out a three pound or called out a two pounder with a three pounder there. Um, but outside of that, I just think that um, right now it seems like anybody, and maybe it's the social media age that we're in that everybody wants to feel triggered about something um, or have a reason to say why somebody did better than them, but nobody's saying why they didn't do good enough. Yeah. You yeah. know, everybody wants to say why somebody did better than them, but nobody wants to say why they they didn't compete. And I think that's a real problem right now. And that, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you don't hear about all the pats on the back. But, you know, I'm really glad to see there was no controversy over John Garrett winning. He's a good friend of mine. You've, you know, fished with his grandfather a bunch. Um, I've been around him a bunch and he's and we 44 tackle used to sponsor him and we just didn't come to a good agreement this year but um you know he's uh an excellent representation and and one of his mentors uh i want to say is uh, mark menendez who's an excellent angler as well and a great yeah. steward of the sport and um you know john is a representation of what a lot of people should aspire to be at a young age because he has worked his butt off he was a boater in the opens before i was well back when i was a co-angler first year i was a co-angler um and you know i used to follow him and you know idolize him even though he was younger than me so well, he's he's already you know, this was his did he did he fish the classic this year no, he did not. Uh, John actually has fished the classic once, I believe, through the yeah, classic bracket the in college. college. But um, and that was, you know, we talked about this the other night. I had some words I probably shouldn't have said to him the day before his final day, but I hope it gave him a little extra fire and a reminder. But you know, at the Arkansas River, he had a, a six fish penalty, um, and that cost him the classic by only a couple ounces, even with the penalty. Um, Yep. And, you know, we had our pro meet and greet night and that episode happened to be on, on the TV at the shop. And he's like, Ooh, that hits a little close. Um, and joking around with John, John and I have always joked around everybody that knows John jokes around with him and he'll joke back pretty hard. And, uh, you know, the night before I kind of, you know, said, man, I can't wait to see you walk up there and grab that trophy. Um, just make sure to count your fish this time. And he's like, Oh, don't even do that to me. And I'm sitting there and you know what the worst part was watching him on live. He caught that seven pounder and, uh, he caught that seven pounder, sat down for a second, looked around and grabbed his rod and picked it straight up in the air. I said, 
damn it, John, don't do it. Don't do it. I said, go count your fish. And sure enough, they cut live, but he, he had, he never had an issue, but, uh, I was going to feel really bad if something happened, but, um, no, he's, he's one of the, the people that some of these young anglers should really aspire to be because he's, he's an absolute, uh, hammer in general. He doesn't do things traditionally. Um, and as far as Kentucky Lake, he's one of the best out there. Oh yeah. Ledge fisherman too. He's one of the best ledge fishermen you could ever be around. Yeah. They're, uh, they're going to go to some lakes that I really and truly think he's going to be able to really shine on throughout the season this year. <clears throat> Um, I see Brandon Ackerson. Um, I will take care of that uh, personally. Uh, that's that's on me. That's not on Harvey. Harvey ships. He sends me all of the emails. I've got some catching up to do. I will get that taken care of. Yeah, he's a little slow sometimes because he's a busy man. We literally had to prize him away from his general Tuesday night outings. To be here <laughs> one hey, we, we we made it here. We made it here. Yeah, so he had to rush home and get on the computer. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're interrupting his normal Tuesday activities. I know if it gets any worse, they're going to have to switch this podcast to Mondays. Uh, you know, Steph is, is dealing with life in general right now. Uh, if y'all paid attention to her social media, uh, her house got flooded. She's dealing with all that right now. So for the next week or two, three, whatever it takes to get her house back in order and, go back to traveling um uh, she's gonna be in and out so we'll see just yeah we've got happens. logan martin coming up in a couple weeks and we yeah. may do something from logan martin because we'll be staying not far from each other up there so we, we could probably make something happen there yeah yeah i will not be there right i will be enjoying my time at home mowing my yard as i've done twice this week because i well no not this week i mowed like friday mowed again today so I've got like the best yard of any angler out there right now. Uh, usually because I, I, for years I've had the mentality that uh, Phil Robertson has, you know, the frost will kill it. <laughs> I don't care how deep it gets. But this year, since I've been home, I've been taking care of the, of the yard a lot more. So it looks like a real like grass yard. It's not a lot of grass out there, but it looks like one. Matt Dillon says, is her boat okay? Yes, that was, in fact, when she FaceTimed me, that was the first thing she showed me. She pulled her boat out of the way of uh, disaster. At least it would have floated, though. Yeah, it might have messed up the trailer bearings if it would have remained in the water for too long. But she got her boat, got her truck, pulled all that out, and got it out of the way, up out of the flood zone. So it's all good. <clears throat> Rachel Post, Brian Post's wife. Hopefully Are Brian's you? watching too. Nice. Awesome. Very nice. Awesome people. Always good to see our teammates watching from the far north. Yep. Not so far north. I don't know. He gets to have some close trips soon. He's been he's been taking the, the long ride. And then after Logan Martin, he gets to take some shorter trips. Yeah, he's got two that are within like three, four hours of his house. Mm -hmm. One that's within, what, two hours? Yeah, lacrosse, I think, is yeah. probably not far. Yeah, he's not very far from my buddy Scott, I don't think. I couldn't tell you what town Scott lives in, but he lives somewhere east Somewhere of, up, uh, up yonder? Yeah, it's that way. It's that way. Yeah, that it's way. It's all that way for me. Yeah, it, well, almost. Because if you left your house, you would probably hit Venice or Texas. So everything else is that way for you. You might be even south of Venice. I don't know. It was 80 degrees here on Sunday. Yeah, it's it, it was like almost 90 here today. Yeah, we hit 87 here, and that's pretty warm for this time of year. Of course, we're going to be back in the 60s come Friday and Saturday. Uh, a little cool front moving through. So we'll see what that does to all the spawning fish we've got right now. That's up in the air for me right now, Matt. I don't know if I'm going to ICAST or not. I will be there. This is the first year in like two or three years they haven't put an open like to where I could only go for a day and have to travel. So I will be there the whole time in the Discover Crystal River booth that a lot of times and then whoever else wants me while I'm there, I suppose. 
Let's see. We got Brandon Ackerson. Do you think the opens will stop being open tournaments and start protecting the anglers that money fish? Uh, that is fact. Um, there's so it's not been released, but uh, through through what the tournament directors have talked about on the backside of things and and kind of talked to the EQ guys about, um, it looks like next year there's probably not going to be co anglers in the opens EQ side. I don't know what that says to the opens. Um, I don't know that they're getting rid of the opens as a thing, but there will be a format change next year, um, for the EQ guys to kind of be a lot more modeled as the elite series schedule looks like and the rules as well. Um, you know, I've been a proponent of that every time I've talked to Chris Bowes and Hank Weldon that, you know, if you want us to be ready for the elites, give us the elite rules and mimic everything about the elites, whether it's information, time on the water, uh, you know, how we handle our fish, everything. Um, and then you don't have to worry. And I think that's a really good testament to, you know, last season, um, of going to the nine tournaments where we had to qualify via nine tournaments versus three, you know, the anglers that you're seeing that made it are highly competitive this year, whatever your outside opinions are of, you know, maybe what the internet's told you. I can tell you after fishing against them all year and watch them this year, nothing has changed with those guys. They're working just as hard as they ever did. And uh, you could put all the stipulations you want on those guys, whether you call them live scopers or computer guys or whizzes or whatever. And uh, it's not going to change the fact whether they can catch fish or not. You know, um, yeah. I personally most think of, that live most scope. Most guys yeah. can catch them regardless. It's yeah. Not about and them. I mean, you know, uh, with or without live scope involved, I think that, um, you know, I've watched, I've personally watched Tyler Williams, uh, with his jig, whether it's with live scope or not, um, you know, straight whoop my butt in my own pond at the house, you know, um, there's, there's just the, the thing that I think nobody realizes when it comes to how they've learned with live scope versus how we had to learn to fish. And it really came into play for me at Wachita this year. Uh, you know, when, the shallow water bite was not fitting into my profile, which is usually what I go for. Um, I panned off the bank for like 10 seconds and saw a fish that was suspended and, you know, took some things that Tyler told me about offshore stuff and threw a jig out at it and I uh, followed it to the bottom and caught it. It was a three and a half pound spot, you know, on my first try trying to pitch to one. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, it just, makes you wonder um you know all the fish over the years that we thought we knew about like if you pull up to a point in 20 foot of water you're throwing a football jig out there you're thinking you're catching a lot of these fish on the bottom after you're dragging it but think about all the times that you've cast a, a jig out there and your first drag you've already got a fish on that fish most likely was suspended in the water column and followed it all the way to the bottom and then picked it up as you went to go drag it for the first time and uh so that opened my eyes to you know what they've seen growing up they're using these uh, i say growing up it you know it's a six seven year old technology now um of, of some sort but you know just having that time on the water of 200 300 days on the water using the technology and putting their faith in it is no different than somebody taking an eight foot rod and going out and flipping mats all day you know they they start to get really in tune to where fish are hanging out what the high percentage spots are that's what these guys have done using that as a technique and they can put their faith in casting to every little dot on the screen and they're being super efficient because every cast is going to one fish whereas we're going down still looking a little blind at things and not really using all the technology to our favor yep it's uh it's one of the things that we have, me and you both, have, you know, you, of course, you're running Garmin, I'm running Hummingbird, and there's, there's subtle differences, uh, but we've had to learn on a different scale than what they have. Uh, yourself having a full-time job, me just not being able to spend every day on the water and learn everything that I can, mm -hmm. I've used it ever since i got it uh four years ago i guess three years ago and it's it's worked i've caught yep. fish with it it's just not 
not my cup of tea. You know, I'm just not, and I, I realize that I'm not near about as good as Tyler and some of the other guys that are out there with it. Um, but if you go back and look at the last, say, five years, uh, you look at the the win Buddy Gross had on uh, Ufala in Alabama. Buddy went and got the whole shooting match, the whole setup prior to the very next tournament and then has a terrible tournament because he spent the whole tournament trying to learn how to use it. Yep. And during the tournament is not the time. No, and that's why I found out on you fo- on a, a, a watch timing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I scrapped my shallow water game and when I say shallow less than 10 foot, um, cause in a place like that, I'd love to like go crank in a DT six or DT 10 and just run down the bank as fast as possible. I'm not a shaky head throwing kind of guy or anything like that. I'd rather be flipping or throwing something moving really quick to cover a lot of water. But it uh, it opened my eyes on that, that I went, man, I, the first fish I threw to, I caught. So let me just, I spent, you know, six hours trying to do something that didn't work. And I spent 10 minutes doing something that did work. The obvious thing is maybe I should be doing that thing. And so I spent the rest of my practice learning how to do that in an uncomfortable manner when I shouldn't have. I should have just spent the rest of that practice uh, just trying to figure out what made my wheelhouse work for that tournament and then spent 10 days on the water elsewhere, even if it was on the way home somewhere or stayed at that lake for another 10 days, just trying to make that bite work when it wasn't a tournament situation is really what I should have done. But time wasn't on my side you know after being there for a week and a half in the blistering cold and rain you know you just want to get home these guys they don't do that they get knocked down and they go out there and figure out why the hell they got knocked down so it's it's a different breed um you know you could say it's responsibilities that they have less responsibilities than we do that's probably true but I'm not going to use it as an excuse because I haven't yeah. made the time yeah. to do it. You know, if I really wanted to do it, just like I want to fish nine opens this year, I figured out a way to do it. If I want to fish 200 days next year, I'll figure out a way to do it. But um, it's uh, it's all in what your drive is. I'm not going to say that, you know, I, uh, I'm i not going to give excuses. I just got beat. That's what it is, you know. Well, that's that's, all, that's both of us. You know, we, mm-hmm. we've, been, we've been beating – by these anglers for the last two years, so to speak, uh, over and over again, the same names keep coming up and they are really good with the technology that they have, but they're also really good if they didn't have it. That's something that a lot of people are missing is that these, these younger anglers that have just came into the elite series, I think the oldest one was what in his thirties. Yeah. Melican. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Milliken is what thirty four. Yep. Uh, and and Ben Milliken is a anomaly in himself because he does nothing but go out and chase monster bass when he's at home. Yep. That yep. is his. That is his niche. That is his deal. He is amazing at it. He's learned so much from watching these fish. And he was catching these fish prior to live scope, if I'm not mistaken. Where is he from originally? Nebraska. Alabama? Nebraska. Nebraska. So he, was, he was catfishing in Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, he, he's been catching fish for a long time. He's just now transmitted what he's known for a long time. Into and he's fished tournament. tournaments a long time, too, you know, yeah. out, out, out in the Midwest. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's catch up on some of these comments here. Uh, Matt Dillon. Uh, what kind of baits are those on your wall that look shiny? Let me see. The shiny ones. I've got a special edition Reaction Innovations Dixon. Vixen. Got four of those actually. And the black, blackout one. And then the other one is shiny, and that's a tiny clash. I saw one today that I would like to have for up north. It's uh, it's kind of like the Tiny Clash, and it's a bright, bright pink. Uh, Frankie Spicer, I guess that is. I think that's right. He's uh, trying to spend more time on the water. 
mm-hmm. to get better, which is something we all aspire to do. I've probably, I've probably spent more days fishing this year than I have probably the last four or five years, but I'm fishing, you know, my home ponds is a little, little private lakes that are right here around the house. Most of the time tomorrow I'm venturing out. I'm going to table rock, uh, Jim Lopez, I fished the Bass Nation series going out of Muskogee on the Arkansas River. What are your thoughts on the events? Uh, on the, one of the toughest events to fish with the fluctuation of the waters. Do you guys have any tips? I think Harvey knows that place a little bit. That that little trophy <laughs> right there, that's where that came from in 2018. Chris Johnson, uh, good friend of mine i've known chris for many many years probably one of the better spinnerbait fishermen in our area uh he caught most all of his fish on a jig right there close to the takeoff area i don't know exactly what spots he was fishing but i I know that uh he said he was fishing that jig extremely slow so that's basically the same way I won that trophy in kind of the same area. I was a little further up the Grand River, uh, and you know I was literally fishing a five-inch fighting frog. Any piece of wood that I could see in the water, I would make multiple casts of that piece of wood, and I was fishing extremely slow as well. When I was there, the fish weren't actively spawning, but they were getting ready to start. You know, they were there were places that there weren't beds the first two days that there was beds on the third day. And that wasn't just me. That was multiple guys in the top 10 that I know that uh, said the same thing. You know, they literally were pushing up to start spawning. I was able to capitalize because the area that I had didn't have as much pressure and the bigger females were in places that were easy enough or easier for me to get into than most guys. But that's, uh, that's one of those oddball fisheries that uh, it's day by day, and you just you just have to figure out things as as each as each day comes, because you may be looking at water that's twelve inches higher or twelve inches lower than it was yesterday, and the fish will move in and out. It's it's really similar to a lot of the tidal systems because of that water fluctuation uh it and, and i love it I, I i had a great time there i haven't fished it since because i'm one and one and i like to keep it that way well i got one tournament there and one win i'm just going as long as we don't go back there and the wait we ain't never going there again yeah i'm i'm good with that <laughs> fine with that yeah the uh the thing I now correct me if I'm wrong and I'm not a good river fisherman by any chance. I get my butt whooped every time I go to a river. Um, when the water fluctuates like that, I've always been told to go back to the first drop or what the, the lowest shoreline is. Is that correct? Pretty much. Um, what I tend to look for is the first thing, whether it be a stump, a log, a drop, a rock, anything the first thing that is off the actual shoreline and it and it, it translates to a to a lot of our river systems that connect to the ocean that are tidal i look for those places the same way the james river for example yep. when that water falls out those fish will literally pile up and i say pile up there may not be but one fish per stump but they'll pile up on those first pieces of cover or structure that are off the bank, whether it be a drop or a rock, or a log, grass lines. There's there's a multiple thing, uh, a different bunch of different things that it could be, but that's where they will go. I mean, they don't have a choice. That's where they have to go. Yep, I've noticed on on tidal river systems like the James that when you're trying to chase fish around that when the tide's just coming in or when it just starts moving, you want to be on the fronts of those creek pockets and creek arms and anywhere that the water is going to expand to, you want to be on the front end of that, wherever the first mouth or opening is, and then kind of work your way back. And then when the tide starts falling, you want to go the opposite way. You want to go as far back as you can and kind of come out with them because it's almost like they're, they're as far back with the bait and whatever else went in there and 
they're trying to stay there as long as they can while there's water over their backs and they just kind of start edging out until the the tide settles yeah and and they're they're actively feeding in that moving water that's that's the thing that i try to concentrate on later in the year is to find what i call feeding zones in current situations right uh the St. Lawrence River is a perfect example because there's always water flow there. I look for places that those fish are going to set up and feed. And whether it be smallmouth or largemouth, they're the same in tidal waters because they're going to look for any type of thing that's going to break that current and give them a protected space to sit and chill because fish are just like me. They don't want to be far away from food. They <laughs> don't want to expend a lot of energy to get that food. You don't want so to see Harvey closer, when he's hangry. Yeah, the closer they are to something that will break that current and keep them from having to fight the current the whole time, the more chances of them getting something washed by them that they can just run out there and grab and come back. Uh, that's just my way of thinking. The Ohio River sucks for everybody. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Every person that I've ever talked to that has fished the Ohio River says it's a just a a mess. Uh, my nephew won a BFL as a co-angler. He caught one bass and had big bass and first place with one fish on the Ohio River. Uh, Charlie Hartley grew up fishing the Ohio River, and he'll straight tell you if you can go there and catch five fish in a day that are bass, you've had a great day. So don't feel bad about not doing well at the Ohio River. All right. So the other part we had that I'm not a hundred percent sure on all this, but was a uh, snagging bass on on forward facing sonar, and I got into a heated argument with Alex from uh, Missile Baits the one time. Uh, this was the classic two years ago at Knoxville, and. You know, he didn't believe that it was possible to snag a bass on live scope. Absolutely. If you really wanted to snag something, I think you could. Would it be an accurate technique? Absolutely not. Um, you know, there's too much delay, like in the in the in the technology, there's too much of a delay to to try to do it every time if you really wanted to. I guess if you had a big enough treble hook, you could make it happen. If you had the right setup for doing that, you could. In, in the this subject matter though i think some people have taken a little far saying you know about jerk baits and things like that i think it opens the door to and we had talked about this earlier it's going to open the door to adding more policing and you know john cruz kind of brought that up to me a while back when they were talking about doing live scope bands and limitations and things like that and there's some things that you have to pay attention to as a tournament director, I see Harvey laughing. I think it has to do with this comment here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I do know, like, I know a lot, a lot of uh, videos I've seen. There's people that are doing that for spoonbill fishing because they snag spoonbill, and I know that that works. But you're talking about a fish that's yeah, giant, sure. giant fish that you're able to, you know, target to 100 pounds. You know, yeah, so and sink crazy. a treble hook over the other side of them, and you know, yeah. slash them. Um, but, uh, you know, and John had brought up a valid point when I asked him what his thoughts were on uh, on banning live scope or things like that. You know, his answer was if Koyoya had one transducer instead of five or seven or however many he has, he's still going to catch them just as good in the places that he catches them just because he's good. Yeah. Um, so if you think you're going to level the playing field by doing that, the guys that are already catching them are probably going to catch them just as good. Um but uh, the the other thing he said was, you know, we already have enough checklists to go by uh, and, and putting enough pressure on the tournament director to get everybody to abide by all these rules that we're putting in place. And, you know, the, the thing he had mentioned about live scope transducers and such was uh, putting limitation on them is now you're going to put that pressure on a tournament director to police how many transducers are on every boat, who's hiding one, who's not hiding one. There's some guys that are sponsored by, you know, Lawrence that uh, I know one of them that got in trouble this weekend for having a live scope transducer on their boat instead of a Lawrence one. 
Um, you know, there's several guys that are running Humminbird products that are still using a Garmin Live to transducer because Humminbird told them it was okay. Um, there's stuff like that going on that, that doesn't get looked at as heavy. Um, but, you know, when it comes to limiting things and adding rules, I think you're putting a lot of pressure on a tournament director to have to police all this stuff. And if somebody, and I don't know if it's just what people want to see, they want to see the drama of having press releases go out every week and people get DQ'd, penalized and whatever else and shaking it up that way. You know, if that's the news that they, you know, really like, then I wouldn't say that's a great idea. But to, to think that, you know, I think it's a case by case basis. I think if you have to verify every catch that goes in a boat, it's just going to add a lot of stress to a tournament director to have to police that. Now, there is a whole lot of rules that they already have to police. Is there integrity? Yes. Is there a lot of things that people are being trusted to by the honor system and protected by polygraphs and things like that? Yes. Um, I would say the limitations that need to start, if there's a limitation on snagging and things like that, I think they should definitely, since now it's been uh, widely known that people are bed fishing on perspective mode, I think that's one that should definitely be like an angler can sit there and say, okay, I'm pulled down on a fish. I know it's on a bed. I'm bed fishing. Should that be in the mouth? Absolutely. Are we going to go check every rattle trap fish, every jerk bait fish, every glide bait fish, everything with a treble hook and say that, you know, uh, how many fish have you caught? Like, especially spotted bass or top water fish and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So, if you put a mandation uh, or a mandate on on the anglers to to have every fish hooked in the mouth by a treble hook, you know how many times have you hooked a fish that you you saw come up and jump? It had a hook in the tr in the in the mouth in the water, and then it turned a different direction, and you've still only got it hooked by the side with the other treble hook, but the front that was in the mouth popped out. You know, so do they have to throw that fish back? Yep. So I, I just uh, you know that's one of the things that should it be put as a rule maybe but overall there's no way to enforce that rule right uh, even if the guys on mlf are willing to uh you know hook a bed fish on live saying they're bed fishing and still hide that it wasn't in the fish's mouth yeah, so you know, what's what's going to happen when somebody's only got a GoPro in the boat with them? You know, I'm not saying that there's not, like, everybody's not honorable. I'm just saying there's a chance that yeah. there's going to be some missed stuff. You're going to hear protests all over the place. You're already hearing protests about somebody blowing out a bed, bed fish with a trolling motor, which I didn't know was an enforceable rule. Um, yeah. You know, uh, there, there's a lot of things like that that, you know, it's going to open the door to everybody protest every second of the day, every time they don't cut a check. So Correct. Um, I'm going to go back to one of these questions just to let Matt know. Matt, I don't follow Josh Jones. Um, I know a lot of people that do. He just, I've never followed him. So I don't, I don't know anything really about that. He, uh, yeah, he charges a lot of money for his live scope trips, but I mean, you know, it's about the experience. It's like anything else. I know guys here that, you know, they started a, a middle grounds trip by us and that's their niche. Um, they charge, you know, 30, they started out like $3,500 for an overnight trip. Now it's upwards of six grand. Um, but it's what you're good at, what your platform is. And, you know, if you want to go catch a, 10 pound plus bass almost every time you go out with them that's what some people pay for yeah. um i know that uh brandon burks that's on the bass boat wire team with me he does the same type trips i don't know what he charges uh but you can literally go watch all of his videos from cast to catch and see how he does it it's pretty pretty educational just to watch what he's putting out because he's not He's not fishing in the stereotypical clear water scenarios that a lot of other people are fishing in. And dude is freaking jacking some giants down there in Texas. Don't know what lake he's on. Not going to venture to say that, but it's not your stereotypical go out and just catch a giant fish every time with the normal conditions. I'll put it that way. All right.
Um, but yeah, the the whole deal with the snagging is, to me personally, if it's on a bed, 100% it should be verified either by camera yeah. or by co-angler or by somebody else that's in the boat with you, Marshall, Judge, whatever. Um, that's uh, Matt Heron's got a perfect uh, setup to help with people that are fishing the tattoo poles that are out there yep. that fit in your uh, seat pedestal hole. Check those out. He's got one that's six feet yeah, jo tall. Josh makes an excellent product. Him, that and his swim baits. I've got a bunch of his swim baits. Um, yeah. You know, they're Josh is a good dude. And in fact, he's the one the other day saw me in the, I got a picture in the bass gallery of my, uh, my raccoon eyes that Andy Crawford shout out to Andy. Awesome. Uh, he always has to get my tan lines in the picture. Let me see if I got, I've got a picture here. Uh, if it'll show up on, but, uh, that was speaking of that. Uh, yeah, when you get a chance, if you've got Josh's number, send it to me. I don't actually, he messaged me on, uh, Messenger, Facebook I Messenger. Was, I hadn't called Matt because of the whole surgery deal right after the classic, and yeah, no, oh, he's good. I saw him the other day. Huh? I saw Matt the other day. He's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. He's just. I, I didn't want to fool with him while he's out there trying to fish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'd wait till after the weekend. They're at St. John's now, and they yeah. only got two days of practice for that one because of the delay. Most everybody, except for maybe five or six have been there before yeah so that's gonna be and that's kind of how i picked my fantasy team let's just go down through here and see who i know that has done well in the past i did terrible on fantasy this week and i think the the florida thing kind of messed me up a little bit i know too much about the lake and it uh it caught me off guard I, I i had one i had one top 10 guy on my fantasy list yeah me too nope one or two one because john cox fell out of the top 10. uh but yeah we both probably had the same guy <laughs> he's a pretty solid pick at any tournament this year i think just, just saying we probably yeah. have the same dude yeah 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 it's hard not to pick him well i knew with his experience that we got there last fall he was going to be really well because of the especially time. the way it's set up that yeah. there's post spawn there's very few fish there they did catch a few on bed um the first day but outside of that you didn't see a whole lot of bed fish being caught uh yeah. but it was uh it was a different kind of bite i can't wait to st john's because it's the first time that they've been to the st john's outside of the spawn yeah. and well, i don't know that you're gonna see a whole lot of bed fish at this one hmm probably very little uh if you do it some late spawners um you know, there are some places there that there will be some. Late if anybody was to know right now on that place, I could tell you Lee Stalvey is the guy to to follow. If it, look at his fish that he's weighed in on any of his night tournaments the last two weeks, you would know if they're spawning or not because that guy is the best bed fisherman in the state of Florida, and I'd put him up there tied with Shaw Grigsby for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's not your normal places that those fish are going to be spawning that are left mm -hmm. either. Uh, some of the cold water springs that come in will have some fish spawning still. And I think all... Rodman's Rodman's probably going to play the hardest at this one. Yeah, I agree with that. Is there... Is Rodman if Rodman's up this year. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it it will definitely it will definitely play a part just because the mats that are there. Uh, I've fished Rodman I think three times. Well, the grass is good. Um, yeah you know you're you're gonna have a little bit more stability because you don't have to worry about the tide um yeah a lot of a lot of factors like that 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 could come to play a lot of timber you know these guys uh -huh. that are good at fishing timber are really going to get in there and yeah. do something um shad spawn get enough grass to have a, a a perfect shad spawn you're not gonna have to worry about your shad spawn areas being out of the water or your shad going a mile and a half up the up the river yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's going to be a, a different deal. There was a shad spawn going off the Harris chain. It was at the tail end. Yeah. Um, you know, I it, it'll come back around. Spawn was on was the shad spawn deal. Uh, he was on a little, he was on a little bit of everything. Cause he was catching, he caught a crankbait off of 
pontoon in the middle of the Haynes Creek there. So, you know, he, uh, I, now that that's another deal, you know, for this one of the St. John's, I'd like to see him win this one. Uh, you know, it yeah. being his 500th tournament in his 50th year with Bassmaster. Uh, and his last time he had a win with Bassmaster was at the St. John's. 2019. And I was there. Right. And so I think, I think that would be like the ultimate cherry on top for him, for his career. Um, he just, you know, got a top 20 at the last one, I think, or 25th, something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, he had a good showing. Yeah. Um, and I think that goes to show you when you've got a grinder tournament, somebody like that, you know, and, and that's a, that's a whole another aspect, you know, uh, prior to the live scope conversation, you had the social media talk, right? That was the, the, the big bullet point. And yeah. I, I got to thinking the other day, I saw a post pop up with that Rick Clun had posted and I looked back at, you know, let me go just to quote the number correctly. Like, you want to talk about the full package? The guy is eight, in his eighties. Yeah, he's still fishing. He's now been with bass for fifty years. Mm-hmm. Still cutting checks, right? And he has the he has live scope. He was one of the first on tour to have live scope. Yep. Right after he saw it on on uh, Cody Huff's boat, yep. and, had, and called Cody and said, "Hey, put that thing on my boat, um, and show me how to use it." And then on top of it, I got to looking at his social profile. Uh, <laughs> all these guys that say you got to be a young guy to have, you know, a social following. Rick Clun has 53,000 followers on Facebook. Yeah. And yeah. posts daily. I think he's got, well, he only started posting daily after the partnership with uh, Professional Edge. Right. Before he wouldn't post daily. Uh, well, I just want to see what his Instagram numbers is. I don't know, but fifty three thousand on Facebook is highly impressive, even if they're paid for. Yeah, fourteen point eight. Right. On Instagram, and he's only Legend. really started posting on Instagram the last six or eight months steadily. Right. Prior to that, it was like once or twice a year. Um. So yeah, he's he's grown his following tremendously over the last six or eight months yep. and we've all grown up with corn yeah you know, everybody in fishing today has grown up with the name rick corn yep uh there's not anybody else that's been out there as long as rick corn and kudos that's- to six cents for recognizing that that man is a legend in the sport and you know yep. i know there was a video hating on six cents from the, the former Guggen squad guys and all that stuff, you know, the Zaldanes of the world, but you know, uh, about, you know, copying this, copying that, whatever. But guess what? Rick Clun is on that side and all those, like half the baits that they said that six cents copied, whatever, you know, it, it's ironic that Rick just pops up in the, the feed there, you know, when they're mostly lucky strike products that they were, they were saying they copied, you know, so um products that he had a big design in it's a it's kind of interesting that some of those products were the ones that they pointed out and now rick cleanse with six cents and you know they're doing all that stuff yeah both at the same time (laughs) oh i didn't type that i think i think when you typed it it went for both yeah it'll post it posted under my name 44 times um but yeah, that's uh, that was a smart move by Six Sense is picking him up. I mean, the dude's been with every, basically every tackle company out there from uh, uh, who made the big O uh, Wardens or Wardells or whatever it was when they mm-hmm. came out with the big O. They signed Klein for a while. Uh, don't. He was with Lucky Craft for a long time. Yeah, 77 years old. He's he's the same age as my mom. Legitimately the same age as my mother. And still out there competing and doing well every now and then. You know, the the St. Jan- the, 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 um, Lawrence River last year, Clon was up there, did really mm-hmm. well. And 
does, you know, I've learned in my lifetime, a lot of the knowledge that I've gained is by reading articles that Klon helped put out. You know, he may not have penned the whole article, but he was out there. Uh, and as far as longevity, nobody's going to ever reach that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even if Kevin comes back to Bass, he's got a gap. You know, I want to see that gap. happen. There's, there's three people I want to see go to Bass, or uh, in some way, shape, or form. I think, and once Kevin, I'd like to see him fish against these guys. Uh, also, um, it was Kevin? Who else? Justin Lucas. Justin Lucas and uh, Alton Jones Jr. I'd like to see them all back in bass. Yeah, you know, you can keep that last one. <laughs> just because. Uh, and Kevin's word, that was his last MLF tournament. He never right. said that was his He last never said tournament. it was his last bass tournament. You're right. He never said that was his last bass tournament. Uh, even at Redcrest, if I'm not mistaken, he never said this is going to be the last fishing tournament I'm ever going to fish. He just said, this is my last MLF tournament. Uh, I'll look for Bobby to make it back eventually. Um, Chris, I don't know. I know Bobby tried. Is Bobby fishing all nine this year? I don't no, know. Bobby's not fishing at all this year. He went back to BPT. He went back to the BPT. Uh, I know in the last three or four years, Bobby's been – been actively fishing the open so it wouldn't surprise me to see a lot more of them be back next year and, it, and it's i said that the last three years and it's never ceased to to be wrong you know we've seen the names jordan lee is back now um yeah and he had a good finish this time too top 10 yeah missed he missed lake fork right mm, i don't know um, yeah i think he missed lake fork because it was red crest yeah he went and fished red crest mm. miss lake fork uh yeah there's just gonna be and it's been a steady stream this year i think you're gonna see dakota ebear probably make it um you know from the bpt side he's yeah. he's a force to be reckoned with he's a hammer yeah stephanie's stephanie slayton is a little bit behind we we covered that earlier but we'll touch on it again yeah I mean, we don't I don't think it. snagging a bass is ever a legitimate catch, but in, in in you know in the spirit of you know I think snagging is considered intentional. Um, how, how do you weigh in what's intentional? Um, you know, and I know there's supposedly a video of what was considered snagging at this last event, but um, I don't know that reeling down on a fish and and catching up to a fish is necessarily snagging when it's on a jerk bait. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to see the video that was referenced on that, but um, it, it's just, it's so hard to police is what it comes down to. But morally, I don't think it's a great thing at all uh, in general, no matter what, what they are. But um, I, I think that, you know, circling back to what we kind of talked about was, uh, I think if it's a bed fish scenario um, where you know that fish is on a bed, I think that needs to be checked in the mouth uh, outside of that. It's so hard to decide if it's if it's been a snagged fish or or whatnot because it's um, you know like like we said earlier, if uh, a top a top water fish or something like that, and the the fish may have had that in its mouth, it intended to eat it, um, yeah. and it could go shake a hook anytime i think i think that's where it gets a little iffy on you know did, did somebody not deserve to have that fish or not you know? so um i, I yeah, don't think we can blame it on having very sharp tackle for landing that fish yeah uh jordan didn't miss the fork event he is setting third in points right now yeah so he's been at all three elite series events this year so far uh has 44 tackle seen a change in sale products due to forward facing sonar? For us, it's a little different because we're in Florida. Um, a lot of the the normal techniques are are there. Um, I do. I will tell you what I have noticed uh, that I don't know that anybody's talked about 
is we are now seeing the transition in our buying behaviors where you had what I like to call COVID buying. Uh, it was impulse buying and it was panic buying. And when people saw stuff on the shelf, they were so excited to see it on the shelf somewhere that they would buy two, three, five, six bags or, or pieces of it. Now, um, I think we're back to the way it was in 2017 where people are buying, I need one bag of speed worms, I need one bag of trick worms, I need one bag of whatever. And then anything that's brand new out there, they'll jump on because it, that's the in-demand product they don't know if they're ever going to get again. Um, so I'm noticing on my side of things that we're not selling the volume of the core items that we were the last four years. And I, I attribute that to the, the, uh, the supply being more available. Um, the, yeah. the forward facing side has not affected our business model as much because we're still able to sell spinner baits and buzz baits and flipping baits and frogs and, you know, all that stuff. And I don't see that to be an issue. Um, but I just, I think that, uh, when it comes down to the evolution, we all just have to, you know, kind of evolve in our way that we sell stuff to people. So that's where we're at. And you're going to start seeing changes in our store of amounts of inventory that we carry and, and things like that. So that's what we're, we're moving towards. Uh, so no, in Florida, uh, but I've talked to people that own shops up near Gunnersville, Tennessee. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I've seen that, uh, you know, those, those places are starting to suffer a little bit. They're, you're going to start seeing where the only thing they're going to start carrying is going to be jig heads, uh, you know, shad style baits, fluke style baits, uh, you know, drop shot stuff, robo worms, uh, things like that. And uh, that's just going to be part of their lifestyle up there, um, you know, where where you're not going to see as much spinner bait, buzz bait, and uh, the the big selection of soft plastics anymore. Um, you know, John Garrett just won this tournament down here on a five XD, you know, and a, a bucktail jig, you know, who throws bucktail jigs in Florida for bass as much, you know, um, I know a few people that do it, but it's not a, it's not a technique that you see a lot. And some of his better fish were caught on a bucktail jig. Yeah. Uh, bucktail jigs kind of a sleeper all over the country and folks overlook the power that that thing has. I've caught some of the biggest smallmouth uh in my fishing career on a bucktail jig in the winter um it, it's a it's a not necessarily a forgotten technique it's just a technique that's not used as much away from the tennessee river Let's see matt says do we sell the ffs glasses no we do not uh that is not gonna happen yeah you might be able to Brian. pick them up from bass boat wired or uh, ffs.com brian says i always have to buy in pairs typically all on the shelf yes i have that problem too even when i go out of town you would you know everybody makes fun of me they're like oh you have your own shop you should have uh you should have everything you need and every time it's uh it's always been one of those cases where i roll up to a place and i never have the right thing that i need that i start getting bit on so i have to buy multiples my garage harvey seen it is full of blue bins of beyond yep. tackle that i probably have just purchased that i have six and seven of just because i never really uh went back and looked to see what i have well we we you being a tackle store owner me working in a tackle store for as long as we as i did we have a different perspective we can walk into a tackle shop see what they're sold out of see what they have an abundance of and kind of get a feel for what's going on at the lake at that time and that's something that i've always been really active at doing is going into a store and looking around okay well they're out of all their frogs you know every frog that they've got is sold out well it must be a frog bite going on so that's a misnomer too that's not always the case especially if you walk into my store you're, for me right. it's not always the case but it's it's a it's just something that kind of okay well let me just make a mental note of that i may not go out and even pull a frog but it just gives me an idea that 
there's either grass around or maybe they sold out of them and they're not going to discontinue them. So I'll ask the question. For me, sometimes it's like a Rob Peter to pay Paul situation. So like seasonal. So you'll, you know, you uh, sometimes have to lower your inventory on certain things to make room for other things. So like, let's say, you know, we're winter time, not people aren't buying frogs. We let those sales kind of go down to where I've got one or two on the shelf of this or that. And then, uh, you know, I'm spending all my money to restock, let's say, jerk baits and speed worms, you know, or yep. trick worms or finesse tactics. Yep. And then we start getting into the spring, the water starts warming up, we load up on frogs and forget about some other things, you know. Um, yep. It's just, you know, we're moving money around where the money needs to go sometimes. And so that's what I, I laugh at that sometimes when we get guys that come in. And they're like, oh, I only wanted that that you're out of because that's what they're catching them on, obviously, because you're out of it. It's like, no, we were just... You know, we don't have millions of dollars. Yeah. 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 I, I kind of, you know, got lazy ordering something because I wanted to spend it on something else. You know, I'd rather have 20 bags of this in stock because it's moving than, you know, worry about yeah. restocking one frog that I'm going to sell next week or three weeks from now. Yeah. You, you, you don't want to have a, an overstock of trick worms when they're biting a the jackhammer. Right. Right. The same. Rick Green's in the house. The, the old timer that travels with me, as oh, they say. This time of night? Good gosh. Uh, yeah, I know. It's past his bedtime. He's usually, uh, he's probably laying in bed right now, keeping his eyes open. He saw we were live and had to come in. Mr. Wake up at 3 a.m. every morning. Uh, Want to know what they're buying on? Just look for the paper bags on top of the box. <laughs> My next right. tournament is Logan Martin. Uh, Stephanie will be there. Uh, Rick Green in the comments will be there with me. Harvey's taking a vacation from the Centrals and the Southerns this year. Correct. My first bass uh, sabbatical, as they say, will be at the St. Clair. Yeah. St. Clair in July. Um, and I will be right back. That's really it. Tim, how's it going, buddy? Uh, we'll do we'll do a quick Q&A section. Uh, if y'all got any questions for me or for Chris, we'll do that real quick. As soon as he gets back, y'all can go ahead and type your questions in. And we're going to go about another five or ten minutes here and then get off. And uh, I'm going to get some beauty sleep. I'll be running... We'll try to run live tomorrow over on the uh, clock app, if y'all know what that is, the TikToks, and try to, I'm going to go to Table Rock and try to catch, I don't know, 15, 16 pounds if, I, if that's possible tomorrow. It's supposed to have some really good weather tomorrow, which has been different than the last few days. So we've been having 40 mile an hour winds and tomorrow at Kimberling City will be 87s with light and variable winds. That's what I'm talking about. Going to uh, fish to the last bass nation on Harris. I'm going to Lake, I think he means Lake Sem. Oh, Lake oh. Seminole for state championship. Yep. Gotcha. Being hyped, the light half pounds Jack Andrews. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. Huh. Oh. I bet I know where some are. Yeah, there you go. Look at this. Look at this, Tim. Yeah. Oh, no. The shot must be out of them. So, when I'm headed up north to St. Clair, um, I will be utilizing a drop shot, uh, three eighths ounce drop shot, seven pound Sunline Sniper, uh, 16 and a half pound Sunline Braid. I can't think of the name of the braid right now, the new stuff they just came out with. And I'll also be utilizing a tube and a swim bait quite a bit. Uh, I've got a couple other things that I'm, I'm going to 
keep on the down low for right now that I'm going to be using up there just because I know a lot of people that are going to be competing in that tournament. And I'll tell Chris before we get there if they're on it or not. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be uh, an exciting exciting northern swing this year for us for sure uh reports on fishing on caddo uh shad spawn oh, is going on right now and they're starting to run around the uh uh bluegill beds it's called the all might yeah there you go it's a sinking all might braid so the braid will sink, uh, will come in mightily handy in certain places I'll be fishing up north this year. But I have already put it to the test, and it is it's some it 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 changes the way. So say say I'm throwing a trick stick or or something along those lines, a Cinco style bait. Uh, it changes the way those baits fall. They seem to fall a little bit faster with a sinking braid and a fluorocarbon leader. So it's uh, it's given me a little bit different uh, presentation. It speeds the fall up, so to speak. Um, and, it, and it's the same setup I've used for years, you know, seven pound Sunline, the uh, one out Kamikatsu, Let's see. It's not. Is it the? I don't even remember what hook it is. It's not the drop shot, split shot hook. Talk about the one that's like the rebarb. The no. G finesse. Uh... No, it's not even the G finesse. It's literally. It looks like the circle hook, but it's not a circle hook. The split shot drop shot hook. No, that one's the one that's shaped like that. This one's more of a just a complete round circle, and I can't think of what it is. Oh, uh, it's the one I use for wacky rigs. Yeah, same, same. It's, one. Uh, yeah, I think it's I, just called the finesse wide gap. Maybe. I think, it, I think that's I think right. That's what they call it. Yeah. Something wide gap. I remember the wide gap yeah. part. Finesse wide gap is what it is. Uh, yeah, I use like a. I think it's a size one or one all. It's a big one for that style of fishing. A little bigger than what most people use, but it's always seemed to work for me. I use it more in open water when I'm skipping around stuff. I use the split shot drop shot but when I'm in open water. When yeah. I don't have to worry about getting hung up, I'll use that a lot more. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> uh, Matt Dillon, I would not know that answer. That'd be more of a you answer. Yeah, I just went over it a second ago. Uh, the shad spawns wrapping up right now on their own bluegill beds. Uh, buzz baits on Caddo for some reason, Devil's Horse, Tiny Torpedoes, always deadly, deadly baits to throw. That's that's about all I got, bro. You got anything else? Oh, I do have something very important. Uh, we just got in. Let me see how many we got left. Anybody watching? Uh, Tyler Williams signature jigs through Greenfish exclusively offered only through us and Greenfish right now. Um, we have available on the website, uh, and that's the little rubber jig and in the craw ball, two jigs. Those are signature colors, main craw and T bug. So we don't have many left. Um, I will share my screen here in a second of the website. As soon as I get it up, I was not prepared for that. Uh, but let up. But uh, we do have we don't have a whole lot left. They actually he announced it on stage yesterday, and they started flying just from the live way in. So, um, I need to call down myself. <laughs> And if you look at Bassmaster.com, you can actually see the setup Tyler was using to finish fifth, fourth, fifth. Uh, yes, uh, fourth, fourth. Yeah. 
actually had it pulled up while ago. Just happened to see it yeah. when I was looking earlier. Yeah. Where'd it go? Want to pass it already? So I've got it here on the screen here. We got the the main crawl. It's gonna be like a Good. orange, orange and brown deal. And then uh the T bug. It's kind of like a little bit different variation than PB and J. Well, for some reason I can't look at all the photos, but I know it was there. Um, but we have that that color uh, in the craw ball as well. Nice. So those uh, are three eighths, half ounce, and three quarter. Tyler favors the three quarter. Uh, we've sold a lot of the halves because it's a little slower fall rate for doing what he's doing. Um, but uh, yeah, they're they're definitely there. Um, but that's uh, that's the only exciting thing I really have to to offer. And it was ironic yesterday uh, when he was weighing in is when I got the call that they actually landed and we got him up on the site really quick. So it was like a it was a quick workaround. I talked to him before just to let him know that they were there. Um, but it worked out really well. So shout out to John for getting him there in time from uh, Greenfish. Yeah, he's usually pretty good about that. Um, uh, Matt Dillon, uh, said Harvey, uh, yeah, I'm looking it up right now. Uh, lizard. Yep. I only throw the eight inch just because it's been, uh, the pro lizard from big bite. And I throw it in the confusion color. Which it was, it won't, well, it ain't pulling up the confusion color, but it's the eight inch pro lizard. Looks like that one. Yes, Scott, it will be valid. They, they don't expire. Yeah. I know the guy that owns the place. It's kind he of a jerk. Some... He, he seems to be all right sometimes. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's my old brother. Watching me on the LinkedIn. See, we even streamed it to LinkedIn. Wow. We're slick like that, bro. Slick, slick. All right. Well, I don't think uh, I don't think I got anything. Anything for next week? Let's see. What uh, is next week? We got anything crazy going on over the weekend? Uh, St. John's will be this weekend coming up. Um, you know, fantasy teams. I picked mine. Uh, I went a little different this week. Um, I will gladly put out my, my picks of what I put, even though Harvey's going to copy him because he's losing in uh, fantasy fishing. Just okay. saying. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Already picked. Already got them. Yeah. All right. Let's see what we got here. All right. So my picks uh, going in are here. Oh. Go ahead and do fancy stuff and present my screen again. I got Canterbury, Davis, De Palma, Gross, Jockinson, Krieger, and Mueller. So I got Tyler Williams, <laughs> Ty Tyler Rivet, John Cox, Logan Latuso, and Cliff Prince. So he basically just just took my picks from last week and moved them over. Well, you you picked him on the wrong lake. Not really. I mean, Logan did pretty good. Uh, Tyler did pretty good. John Cox didn't do terrible. I mean, you know. Man, I forgot to tell you at the classic. I got to go hang out with all those boys, all your uh, your buddies from Louisiana. Oh, well, I'm sure because they. I don't know what the relationship is between the guys from South Louisiana 
and uh, it, th- there's there, so from what I've been told, there is one relationship that has made that it all happen, and and you know who that is, your boy Dave. Yeah, Dave Cabell, super super great guy. Oh, uh, dude, awesome, awesome well, guy. Um, little little out there, but where he's from, that's kind of accepted. Yep. Uh, but probably one of the one of the greatest fishermen I've ever had the pleasure of watching actually do his thing on the water. Just the man is phenomenal at putting baits in places that most of us just look at and go, ah, I can't even make that cast. Right. And he's already got his bait in there and, and pulling a three, four pounder out of it while you're looking at it going, how do I get my bait there? Yep. Uh, he qualified for the Bass Nation National Championship on Grand in November on, on the Louisiana team. Came up and fished as a co-angler for the Arkansas tournament and finished second as a co-angler on a body of water he had never seen in his life. Yep. Well, I finished second on the boater side, and I'd only been there like once, maybe. I think I've been there one time. Uh, but, yeah, that's dude is just that good. Straight up. I'm going to have my hands full at Grand in November. I promise you. Yep. So here's my uh, my drain the lake picks. I got Rick Klun, John Cox, John Cruz, Logan Latuso, Cliff Prince, Bill Lowen, Mike Iconelli, and John Sokup. Wait, what? That's for drain the lake. Okay, so I screenshotted the drain the, or I screenshotted my other ones twice. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to look. Who do I have? I'm drain the lake. Here it is. And I said tiebreaker sixty two pounds. Oh no, so I'm I'm wrong. Uh the drain the lake is who I actually showed everybody and my fantasy fishing team. Chris Johnston, Paul Mueller, Steve Kennedy, Brandon Polnick, and Cliff Prince. Yeah, right there. Because ah. <laughs> all them boys right there on that body of water, Kennedy's do. I mean... You know, I think... You, you know where I'm saving him for? I think... Uh, Depending on where he falls in the buckets for fantasy. See, here's my problem with the fantasy fishing thing is where they put them into the buckets and you can only choose one out of the bucket. Yeah. You know, bucket A, you look at it and like, I would like for this tournament, I'd like to go Tyler Williams. I'd like to go Patrick Walters. I'd like to go JT Tompkins. I'd like to go Kyle Patrick. I'd like to go like, there's so many good people. Yeah, that would exactly. fit to that. I mean, even John again on that, just because of the way that place is going to fish, he's got momentum behind him. Um, you know, the way the St. John's is going to set up for a, you know, late April tournament, John would be a really, really good pick. Uh, you know, Hank Cherry would even be a good pick for the way that place gets it. Stetson would be a good pick for the way that place sets up. Yep. Um, you know, it's hard to pick somebody out of that, so I just went with a, a you know, kind of favorite. I can't can't leave him out. I, I vowed that every tournament this year, Tyler's get picked. So yeah, maybe a little close to that actually, one. It's actually a really good plan. Don't worry. I mean, you know, he's second in AOI. It can't be a bad pick, right? Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, so uh, it's the only. I think the only reason why I didn't pick him there is because of Johnston's history. Uh, that was the only, the thing it came down to is Chris Johnston has a really good history. And even into later times of the year back in FLW, um, he was really solid when they were down there. That was the only thing that made me choose him over Tyler. Right. All right, bro. Let's wrap this thing up for tonight. <clears throat> I got to get my beauty sleep before I go to Table Rock tomorrow. Hope uh, you got more than 24 hours before then. Uh, no, not really. It's going to take gonna, a long time to make that face beauty. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I am kind of pretty. I even got the pretty settings on my 
camera tonight, so I'll be looking. Oh, uh, is that why your face is so smooth tonight? Yeah, that's why I'm being looking. I thought so you I just had. Good. I thought you stepped up your moisturizer routine. No, no, I put the little. There's a little button on the camera thing that says, you know, make you look pretty. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I'll use a filter. I Man, scared. I should have used a filter. Maybe I could have got rid of <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. But it just it smoothed mine out a little bit. That's what it did. Like I put some concealer on. I think is what they uh, call I'm it. I'm a I'm gonna take this weekend a little different than last weekend. I I then learned a lesson last week, and I I want to taste food again. Probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah I I can't eat anything right now. This thing hurts so bad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I carried the big round stick that comes from uh, Cracker Barrel. Hmm. The, I'm just I'm just going with the good old yeah. fashioned Blistex. Yeah. yeah, that works. All yeah. right, bro. Well, everybody, thank y'all for joining us tonight. Um, we will be somewhere around next Tuesday. Make sure to tune in to the St. Johns River. Check it out. If you are in Florida and you are near the St. John's River and you've ever wanted to ride in a Skeeter, I will be there doing demo, demo rides uh, on, uh, at the Palatica City Docks from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. every day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the Elite Series event. Come out and uh, come go for a ride in a Skeeter FXR20. Nice. nice other nice. than that, that is uh, Chris Kingry and Harvey Horn signing off for the night. And we may be able to get a uh, uh, one of our guests to show up next week uh, and see what we can do. Yeah, they'll be off next week, so maybe we can get yeah. one of the athlete and pros on here. We may even get the Stephanie Pellerin back on here. Possibly. All right, everybody, y'all have a great night. Chris, thank you, sir. Absolutely.